think we're on, but it's not. Let me let me make sure I'm gonna text. Uh... Okay, yeah, we're on. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, please. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Uh, very grateful for the opportunity to uh, take a blessing of uh, discussing one of the book of the Old Testament. The book of Habakkuk is one of my favorite one. Uh, and uh, we give it a title, Trusting God in Uncertain Time. And it seems to be very fitting for the time we are in right now. So... <clears throat> The book of Habakkuk is uh, only three chapter. It's a small book in the Old Testament. It's one of the minor prophets. And it is different than any other book of the prophets because all the other books, they present a message from God to the people. They talk to the people about what God's message is, whether it is a message of hope, a message of repentance, message of warning, but this book, Habakkuk, is not talking to the people. He is talking to God about the problem of the people. So that's make it so different than any other uh, prophecy book in the Old Testament. And he actually starts his book by saying, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. So he had a burden in his heart, and he went to God in prayer with this burden. And... Uh, the first few verses, he took this burden to God. He said, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? So he's wrestling with God. And actually his name Habakkuk means to wrestle or to uh, embrace. So he's wrestling with God about a burden that he has in his heart. And he asked the two common questions that most of us will ask when we go through a difficult time, how long, why? And uh, so that's why this book is really fitting and it is timeless. It is short, the book, only three chapters, but it, but it is a very deep book because it addresses several issues, apologetic issue, why there is evil in the world and what is God doing about this evil and why God allow right, an evil person to prosper and righteous to suffer. Very common questions you see throughout the Bible. And it also uh, has deep lessons about prayer, uh, how a man named Habakkuk went to God and reasoned with God and pray with and ask him why and how long. And it also had theological lesson because it teaches us about trusting God in an uncertain time. And it has a verse that St. Paul liked so much that he used this three times in, in the, uh, his letters, the righteous shall live by faith. So it's a short book, but it, had, it is a deep book. As I said, it is three chapters. Uh, and it progress from starting in chapter one with someone is crying out to God, uh, sighing. Uh, he used the word to cry twice in the first verses. How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence and you do not save. And then move to chapter two to uh, someone is seeking God's will and God's plan, and he's trying to understand what is God doing about the situation he's in. So that's chapter two. And then chapter three, he uh, shout in singing and praising in a beautiful song in uh, chapter three. He said, the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me walk upon mine high places. So the whole book moves from uh, start in the valley with a sigh to see God in the tower. He said, I will go to, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint, seeking God, and then moves on to worship God. So you can say that uh, the book of Habakkuk is started with wondering and wrestling with God. He prayed and there is an answer to prayer. And when God answered him, he gave him a plan that he didn't agree with. He said it was an unexpected plan to him. So he was wondering and wrestling with God in, in the first chapter. And then he did watching and waiting. He climbed into the uh, watchtower 
to the and to wait, watching and waiting. And then finally, he's worshiping and witnessing to God, trusting God in whatever situation he's in. And he say, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be in the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, uh, though the flock may cut off uh, and there is no herds, but I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in God my salvation. The Lord, the God is my strength. So what a change. And that's why this book is a beautiful book, because we can go through those stages too. We can be wondering and wrestling at certain time. We could be on a stage of watching and waiting for God. And uh, we hope all of us reach the point of worshiping and witnessing about God's grace and God's work in our life. Again, at chapter 1 and 2, wrestling with God. Chapter 3, resting in God. Chapter 1 and 2, miserable, and he is down in the dumps. And chapter 3, he's joyful, and he's on high mountain. Shouting and crying and praying in chapter 1 and 2, singing and praising in chapter 3. He was very impatient in chapter 1 and 2, but he is patient and waiting for God to show his glory. He was asking for justice, and now he's asking for mercy. So this is just a survey of the book of Habakkuk. And it's actually similar to a lot of psalms that David has sung. The most common one is Psalm 13, when he said to the Lord the four times, how long, in his psalm. So he started by saying, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel on my soul, having sorrow on my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Four times, how long? Consider, hear me, enlighten my eyes. Uh, and then at the end, he ended with, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So start with how long was wondering and wrestling and end with worshiping, similar to the book of Habakkuk. So the book of Habakkuk is trusting God even when it's really tough or faced during troubled times. And the, my discussion today will focus on three points. The first one, what was burden? What was the burden that Habakkuk has? And uh, how did he take his burden to God? There was first uh, conversation with God. There was two dialogue, uh, first and second dialogue, and then the praise of the Lord in chapter three. So let's talk about the burden and to understand the burden of Habakkuk. First, we need to know where is Habakkuk in the history of the Old Testament? As you all know, the kingdom under David and Solomon was one united kingdom, and then it was divided into North Kingdom and South Kingdom. The North Kingdom, all their kings were wicked and ended up being destroyed completely by the Assyrian and taken into exile in 722 BC. The South Kingdom had some good kings and godly kings, and it lasted longer, but eventually also was taken into exile for 70 years by the Babylonian and returned back to build the temple and build the wall until Christ. So Habakkuk was at the time just before the Babylonian attacked the South Kingdom, uh, his timing about 600 BC before Christ. He was a contemporary of other prophets too. Uh, the most common one is the prophet Jeremiah. He was also a contemporary of Zephaniah. He came immediately after other great prophets, Isaiah and Micah. Uh, those are and Joel, those are the uh, prophets to the south kingdom, which is called Judah. And uh, in the north there was uh, Amos and Hosea, other prophets. So what was happening in the world at that time, before Babylon became a strong nation, there was the Assyrian, and the Assyrian were conquering the world until 612 BC, when the Babylon started to become a strong power and then took over the world and became the great power of the world at that time. So during Habakkuk time, Assyria was fading down and Babylon was getting stronger, 
and uh, it was just to be he was his time was just before Babylon came to attack Judah and take them into exile. The kings during his time was he uh, was living during the end of the life of a godly king named Josiah. King Josiah became a king when he was 16 years old and he wanted to repair the temple that was been ignored for years and years. And when they were repairing the uh, temple, they found the word, the law, the, the law of Moses, and they read it for the first time. And he wept and he was so touched by the word of God and the revival occurred during his time. So Habakkuk was at the end of this revival. So he witnessed this revival that was done by Josiah. The king that came after Josiah is King Jehoiakim. And this king was ungodly king. And he encouraged idol worship and ignored the temple, ignored the word of God. So Habakkuk also lived during this time, the time of King Jehoiakim. So Habakkuk was a, then, uh, to summarize, he was a prophet to the South Kingdom during King Josiah and Joachim. He was contemporary of Jeremiah. He was actually from the tribes of Levi, and he was a priest. And uh, usually priests start the service at age 30. He served until he became 50 years old. And then, then later on, he became a prophet after that. Similar to what happened to Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a priest and then became a prophet. God sent him to tell the nations about him. So his name means, as I mentioned, embrace or cling or hug or wrestle. And his name is fitting for his what he was doing. He was wrestling with God. Saint Jerome called him the fighter of God because he wrestled with God in prayer. And he wrote this chapter three, which is considered to be a song. And they used to pray this song in the temple. It was given to the Levites to pray it. Because his name means in praise, uh, you could say that chapter one, he was trying to hug the problem, focusing on the problem. That's why he was down. He was, his eyes was mainly focusing on what's going on. Chapter two, he started to embrace and hug the people because God told him, I know that the people are away from God, but I'm going to send the Babylon to discipline them. So he started to hug the people or embrace the people. And then finally, he embraced the Lord, hugging the Lord himself. So those are another way of looking at those three chapters. What was his burden? His burden was uh, King Joachim, as mentioned, was an evil king who destroyed the scroll that Jeremiah wrote. Jeremiah wrote the word of God and Joachim was anti-God and he actually threw the, the, uh, the scroll that Jeremiah wrote in fire. There was a lot of immorality going on, idol worship going on. The people didn't love each other. There was violence, injustice, the wicked abused the righteous. The law is paralyzed, meaning that the people knew the law of God, but was paralyzed, was not effective in their life. They just had knowledge about it, but they didn't do it. They didn't follow the law of God, and the people didn't love each other. So Habakkuk was burdened about the situation, seeing the decline. And after the great revival that happened by Josiah, he saw the decline spiritually of the people, and he started praying to God about it. And he uh, also, at that time, as I mentioned, Babylon started to become in power and took over Assyria. So what did he say? In chapter one, the first dialogue with the Lord, he came to God and said, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? cry out to you violence, yet you don't save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. So the burden that uh, Habakkuk has was the condition of his people spiritually, the 
the, the silence, what seems to him the silence of God. God is as if God is not doing anything about it. So he was confused, he was frustrated, and he was burdened by that. So he was burdened and overwhelmed by God's law is paralyzed, people's spiritual condition declining, and the lack of love among them. So he went to God in prayer. He was not like any other prophets who were very strong to preach and give sermons and, and do all kind of things. He only thing he knew what he knew to do was to pour himself in front of God in prayer and uh, open his heart to God. He had a broken heart about what's going on. Some people in a situation like that may give up. They say, well, there is nothing I can do. They might isolate themselves or hide or deny, but he went to God in prayer. He was bothered by also by the silence of God. And he seems to see uh, in his talk to God as if God is, seems to be distant or silent. Is God seeing and caring? Is, God, is he ignoring the events in the world that's happening to us? Does he know the gravity of the situation we are in? Where are you, God? Basically, that was his first wrestling with God and prayer. But if we analyze his complaint, we can ask, was God really silent? For many years, as I mentioned before, God has sent many prophets to the South Kingdom. Isaiah was one of them. Jeremiah was one of them. Great prophets to talk to the people about God and reminding them about the law of God and warning about destruction that could happen if they ignore it. He had some godly kings, like a King Josiah that I just mentioned, and many other godly kings. He delivered them from many enemies. If you recall, the Assyrian at one time attacked the South Kingdom and God sent an angel and killed thousands of people to protect the nation from the enemies. So God was not silent. He sent them many blessings. He sent them many messages. He gave them many warnings. And what happened to the North the Kingdom should have been a warning for the South Kingdom because they are taking the same path that the North Kingdom is taking. So sometimes when we are in difficult situation, we tend to forget that God is always working. And it is a good book to read uh, who wonder where is God? He is working and he's in control, but we tend to forget. So God replied to his first uh, complaint and he said to him, look among the nation and watch, be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. For indeed, I'm rising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. So as if God was saying to, to uh, Habakkuk, I am not silent. I've been doing a lot of things. I am very patient and long-suffering. I don't want to discipline the people, but it treat they it reached to the point that nothing worked with them except sending them this great army, the Babylonians, that will attack them and will discipline my people. So it is a lesson in God's patience and long suffering. It was an unexpected answer to uh, Habakkuk. He didn't expect that God will do that. Uh, and sometimes when we pray and say, they will be done. Sometimes we want our will to be done, but uh, here in this prayer, God give him his plan that was unexpected plan to uh, Habakkuk because he's sending a bitter and nasty nation, terrible and dreadful, their horses swifter than leopard, their horsemen like an eagle, and uh, they worship their net and burn incense to their dragon that are going to be discipling his own nation. So the first to complain of Habakkuk, God, you're, you're doing little about the situation in Judah. The second to complain, God, you're doing too much by allowing the Babylonians to attack Judah. God, you are missing my point. I'm concerned about my people, not asking you to go. So 
he started to second dialogue or second prayer, chapter one still, and he said, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O rock, have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to uphold the evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who dread treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devour a person more righteous than he? So he's asking God, you, the Babylonians are not good people. They are wicked people. They are more wicked than us. And you are allowing them to attack us and to, to uh, discipline us. You are a holy one and you, you will not die. You are a covenant God. You, you are a rock. So he started to discuss with God about this plan. He basically wanted God to interfere, but in an abandless way. And he said this is, was worse than he had hoped for. But in his prayer, uh, he was asking, why is God allowing a more wicked nation to devour a less wicked nation? And your eyes are too pure to behold evil. But he was in this prayer mentioned several good characters of God, that God is from everlasting, that he's eternal, does not change, he's holy, that he is our rock, he is the one that we are standing upon, that when he say we shall not die, he remind God about the covenant, that there is a covenant relationship that we have with you, that we will not die. So he goes on from chapter one to chapter two to this tower, he will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. So he went there for a quiet time, trying to meditate and digest all what he knew about God, who he is, what he has done, what was his promises to us, what he's allowing to happen to us. He's waiting to God to clarify all this point. He is trying to understand what his God is doing. And he spent some time watching and waiting. Verse 2 said that God answered him, but we don't know the time from this verse 1 and verse 2. How long did he take him to stay in this watchtower? And how long he struggled with trying to digest all what he knew about God in this time? So he went to the tower to seek God, and what will he say to me? And he started to recall things that he knew about God's characters. And in verse 2, uh, it said that God answered me. What was God answer to him? God answer to him was this great verse that you should trust me. The just shall live by faith. I will use Babylon to discipline my people but I will eventually punish Babylon for their cruelty. My people will, through this discipline, will be clean from idol worship. And in the history after, after the return from exile, we never heard of Israel worshiping idols anymore, which was a struggle for many, many years from the time of Joshua, uh, from the time of Judges till this time. It was a struggle that they always wanted to imitate other nations and worship idols. But after they returned from exile, they, they stopped worshiping idols like other nations. And they returned to build the temple again. And that was a preparation for the coming of Christ, which they, this was 600 years before Christ. So God answered to him, explaining to him why he did that, what will happen in the future. And he spent some time meditating on God's characters, God's promises, and God's action in the past and what he's planning to do in the future. So this quiet time was very important for him to make him trust the Lord. And God told him, write this vision. The righteous will, uh, shall live by faith. And this is a verse that I mentioned that St. Paul used it in Roman, Galatian, and Hebrew. And the book of Romans talk about the just or the righteous, how to be right with God, justification. And the book of Galatians talk about how to live, talk about freedom. And the book of Hebrew talk about faith. So St. Paul used this verse to be the title or the, uh, the theme for all those books, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrew. 
So write this vision, trust me. And I will judge the Babylon. There is chapter two, five woes to the Babylons for being greedy, for being uh, dishonest, for being cruel. And uh, so five woes and punishment to them. And then he told them in verse uh, chapter two, he said, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. <clears throat> Habakkuk was struggling with, is God in control? Is what is happening in the world? Is it beyond his, is, is it out of his control? And God has told them, the Lord is in his holy temple. I am sovereign. I am still in control. Nothing happened outside of my control. I know what I'm doing, Habakkuk. Calm down. Your fear and concern are not valid. So he told them the Lord is in his temple. And he told them also something that will happen in the future, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. You worry about the people ignoring uh, uh, the word of God and the, the law is paralyzed. It's going to be coming a time when it will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of God. So this was God's reply, and this is what Habakkuk discovered when he was in the watchtower. He discovered that he should live by faith and trust to God in whatever situation, that God allowed Babylon to discipline his people, but this discipline will be for the benefit of the people because they will get rid of the idols, they will return back, they will build a temple, they will receive Christ. Uh, so that was the answer. There were two prophets in the Old Testament that both of them I like so much, Jonah and Habakkuk, but both of them are different. Both of them struggled with God's will. Jonah, God's will for him is to go to Nineveh, but he ran away from God. God's will for Habakkuk that he will send the Babylon to discipline his people. And he ran towards God instead of running away to God. He ran away to God to understand uh, and to uh, know what God's will is. Jonah, his main issue was how can the nations be saved, Not only Israel? Habakkuk problem was, is God in control in the situation of what's happening in the world? Jonah, his story ended with Jonah was upset. Habakkuk, the story ended that he was joyful and praising God and saying one of the beautiful songs of the, New, of the Old Testament. Jonah learned the will of God in the fish billies. And Habakkuk learned the will of God when he was in the high tower. Now we come to the last chapter of Habakkuk, which is chapter 3. And this is chapter to start with prayer, verse 1 and 2. And then he started to describe God in a beautiful song, uh, describing who is God, describing his power, describing his action that he did in the past, that he will do in the future. And then he ended up with this awesome uh, praise, 16 to 19, which he will say, I will, no matter what, I will rejoice in the Lord, my strength and my salvation. So in this chapter, he recalls some historical event. He recalled the descent of God in Mount Sinai, who gave the law. He recalled the, uh, the parting of the Red Sea and the Jordan River and the people crossed. And he also looked ahead about the coming of Christ in this song. So when we remember the past, and when we look at the future, we can have renewal in the present. It is the reminding of the past, revealing of the future, that so you might have renewal in the present. So it started by saying the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigunoth, which is an instrument or a tune. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. When he, start, when he was in the tower, he started to remember God's deed. And he came out of this uh, quiet time very strong. And he said, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. I know you will come and let the Babylon judge us, but remember mercy. 
and grants in your discipline, remember mercy. And I mentioned he recall event from the past, the giving of the law and the appearance of the Lord on top of Mount Sinai, the crossing of the Red Sea, the coming and delivering of his people. So he remembered that. And he also talks about a symbol, one of the simple uh, fathers who looked at this verse and say this is talking about incarnation. It said, his splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hands where his power was hidden. And they say this verse talk about uh, incarnation, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the arm of God and rays flashed from his hand. His power was hidden. He hid his divinity. Light is a symbol of divinity and hand is a symbol of humanity and the hidden power is God empty himself and hid his power, his divinity inside him. And then he ended up with this beautiful uh, prayer. Uh, he said, despite bad things that, what is the worst thing? Imagine the worst thing that could happen. They were farmers. So what is the worst thing that could happen? No fruits, no uh, sheep, no cattle, uh, famine, destructions. Even if this happened, though the fig tree does not bud, there is no grapes in the vines. And, the olive crops fails and the fields are produced no food. No sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. What a change. His joy is not on the situation outside. His joy was solid based on knowing God, who he is, his promises, what he has done and what he will do. The sovereign Lord, this was the issue that he was struggling with. Where are you, God, with all those bad things happening? Are you in control now? He said, you are the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of the music on my stringed instrument. So trusting God, facing the storms of life, yet I will rejoice. So this is this is slide just to summarize the book of Habakkuk, which is a simple but beautiful, deep book. Uh, starting with, why are you not judging Judas? Sin, God. God said, I will by sending the Babylon. Habakkuk said, but you can use nation more. You cannot use nation more wicked than Judah. Sure, but I will judge them too, and end up in the last prayer, chapter three. Our God is an awesome God, and I will wait patiently for the judgment that will come and rejoice in the Lord. So this is message of Habakkuk is a timeless message. It transcends time. Uh, no matter what happened, you are my joy, O Lord. The one who was wrestling with God turned to become a worshiper of God. The one that was sobbing turned out to be singing. And we can do the same if we learn the secret of the tower, like what Habakkuk did. So if we want to learn to trust the God from this book, we can see several lessons and I will finish with them. They will show us if we can apply them in our life, we can also learn to trust God. First of all is to bring our burden to God in prayer. God does not feel offended if we come to him in prayer and say, why? Does not feel offended if we come and say to him, how long? Uh, he asks us to cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. And uh, he said in Isaiah chapter one, let us reason. And prayer will build up this trust in God. And prayer will clarify God's will to us. So don't make your burden separate you from God. Make them push you towards him. Habakkuk was wondering what is God up to. And he asked it why. And God is willing to accept our prayer when we come to him also in humble way, uh, trying to understand his will. During the time of difficulty, we are most tempted to pull away. But this is a most important time that we need to wrestle, play, pray, and stay. 
when he wrestled with God, he found his strength and joy. He didn't understand everything, but he trusted God and asked him to help him to understand. There is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is struggling to understand. And some, some people call uh, Habakkuk is a doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. Uh, doubt is based on thoughts that come to our mind. Unbelief is total rejection and rebellion against God, and it is based on the matter of heart, it's refusal of God from the heart. Doubt when we don't understand what God is doing and why he is doing it, but we come to him in a humble way, seeking to know why, seeking to understand, seeking his presence. Unbelief is when we know what God has told us and we refuse to believe it. So what helped Habakkuk to move from doubt to trust in God is he took to talk honestly with God and he had this quiet time with the Lord in the tower. Uh, and in that quiet time, he meditated in God's character. It would be nice to read those three chapters alone and write down all the characters that mention about God in the three chapters. You will find he mentioned that God is from everlasting. He's eternal. He does not change. He mentioned that God is rock, solid. He mentioned that God is holy and his eyes is pure not to see evil. He mentioned that God is a strength. mentioned that God is salvation. He mentioned that God is sovereign. So he mentioned all kind of characters of God. And, and when he remembered those characters of God, that helped him to trust him. You would not trust to someone you don't know. And he reminded himself of God's action, action in the past. He reminded himself of what God has done in the past, parting of the Red Sea, crossing the Jordan River, giving the law, protecting the people, and guiding them in the desert for 40 years. Remi remember what God has done in the past. For us, we are more privileged because we can remember even more what God has done in the past. For Christ died on the cross for us, for he's sending the Holy Spirit. He's preparing a place for us in heaven. So remember what God has done, <clears throat> God's action, and learn in God's promise. When he said we will not die, he was reminding God of his covenant relationship that we will not die. It is not your will that we'll die. Also, what helped him to move from doubt to trust in God is he submit to God's will. God, it's your will that you will send discipline to the people. You know better. It will bring benefit. I don't see it. My will is not to hurt them that bad, but your will is much better. You know better. Submit to God's will, and he waited on God's timing. Some quotes at the end. Someone said, we must see our circumstances through God's <coughs> Love rather than seeing God's love through our circumstances. So some people tempt to see the things that happen to them and they decide if God loves them or not. If it's bad, maybe God doesn't love me. If it's good, God loves me. But he's saying here, no, don't look at that way. Look at your circumstances through God's love. Everything that happened to us because he loves us and he knows better for us. Another quote, all that I have seen, teach me to trust God for all that I have not seen. Because what I have seen God does in the past make me trust him more. What his record of performance of what he has done in the past is 100%. So I can trust him in the future. Psalm 56, 3 said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And the right questions when we go through a difficult time may not be why, may not be how long, it may be what do you want me to do, O Lord? For Habakkuk, what God wants him to do is to continue pray, to trust him, to be in the tower, and to meditate on his characters, his word, and his action. Some of the reason people are not trusting God, they may have distorted image of who is God is. So it's very important that we know God's character, that he's love, that he's in control, that he's sovereign, that he's mighty, that he's caring, that he's available, that he's present, he's Emmanuel, 
So having a distorted image of God can make you not trust him. Forgetting about his promises and his actions that he did can make you not trust him. That's why it's important to have daily time with the Bible to remember the promises of God and his action. Having a different goal in life. God's goal is to want us to be Christ-like, want us to be with him in heaven. Our goal may be some pleasure in this world. So trials and could make us not trust the God because we have a different goal in life. Lack of having a stillness and silence before God and fear and worry. So with this, I will uh, finish and uh, I'll uh, <coughs> mention that this book of Habakkuk is a very uh, important book for us to study, especially during this time to learn to move from wondering and worrying to spending time and eventually to be worshiping God like Habakkuk worship him. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.